Erev Tov, everyone. We're going to get started. A uh, welcome tonight uh, to uh, Sarah Labaton, who is here to teach us. Welcome to all of you who are here to, to learn from Sarah. Sarah, I want to frame this moment this way. First of all, I just want to thank you because we always love learning with you. We always love learning with your colleagues from Hartman. It's just always wonderful. But I feel that there is a practical urgency to you being here now that I just wanted to name and then I'll give it to you. Uh, the ritual that American Jews do more than any other ritual, and there's data and literature on this, is the Pesach Seder, um, which means that 12 nights from now, it's April 10th and the first Seder is April 22nd, 12 nights from now, uh, the, the ritual that more American Jews will do than any other ritual is sit down to the Seder table 12 nights from now. And when they do, I think it is fair to say that every Seder table faces some version of the same dilemma. Do we talk about what's real and what matters and what breaks our heart and what is a cluster and what is a hot mess and what has no answer or not? And if we do, it feels like we have to, how could we not? It sinks the Seder and everybody's in kind of a lousy mood. Or we purchase a nice evening at the expense of not talking about what matters. And that's just a lousy choice that nobody is happy with. And so what's particularly great to have you here now, 12 days before the first Seder is, how do we talk about what's real in a way that can leave us inspired. Thank you, Sarah Lebanon. Good evening, everybody. And thank you so much, Rabbi Wes. Thanks to all of you for being here. We always say at Hartman that Temple Emmanuel has a very special place in the heart of the Hartman Institute. So I just want to express my gratitude for having me here tonight, my gratitude to, the, to all of you for coming, to the rabbinic and executive and lay leadership of this wonderful synagogue for modeling what vibrant, com vibrant community with learning at its core could really look like. So in many ways, we are living at an unprecedented time in Jewish history certainly idiosyncratic. Over the past 75 years, the Jewish people has built, have built two powerful, stable, and successful, thriving homes in North America and in Israel. And of course, American Jewish power and Israeli power, American Jewish success and Israeli success are quite distinctive, and yet, they are interdependent, interconnected. If we think about the American Jewish philanthropy and lobbying that goes towards Israel, and when we think about the role that Israel plays in American Jewish identity and imagination. And as the events of October 7th and the subsequent war in Gaza have illustrated, American Jews in the 21st century and Israelis are vulnerable, existentially vulnerable. And in the same way that the nature of our power is distinct, the nature of our vulnerabilities, our respective vulnerabilities, are distinct as well. And they are intertwined. And sometimes it even feels that the reality of Jewish power sometimes makes us Jewishly vulnerable. The experience of being a Jew in the 21st century is of toggling back and forth between power, flourishing, success, safety, and the reality of vulnerability of anti-Semitism, the threat and the reality of attack. And there are so many examples of this phenomenon. I'm sure many of you saw the recent uh, cover of The Atlantic, where Franklin Foyer wrote a piece titled, The Golden Age of American Jews is Ending. And as I read the piece, I was thinking, but it's on the front cover of The Atlantic, right? And on the Israeli side, it is true that Israel 
unfortunately did not keep Jews safe on October 7th. And we all know that more Jews died on October 7th than on any single day since the Holocaust. But Israel gave Jews the tools to, be, to defend themselves and to fight back. Each of you are going to get an image. And I want you to take this image and turn to the person sitting next to you and discuss whether you see Jewish power reflected in the image, Jewish vulnerability reflected in the image, a combination of both or perhaps neither. And by the way, I'll just say that this could be a great Seder exercise. I know that some of you are looking for ways to make the Seder meaningful, engaging, and accessible. Um, and I'm very happy to send out a file of these images if that could be helpful to you. Uh, there may not be enough images, but we can, you can share if you want, if that works. Okay, great. So take a couple of minutes. Talk with your partner. Yeah, talk to the person sitting next to you. Does the image reflect Jewish power, Jewish vulnerability, a combination of both or neither? That's the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm gonna call us back together, and you can continue these discussions later or at your Seder tables. But what I think this exercise illuminates is that the experience of being Jewish in the 21st century is a complicated one. It consists of many different snapshots, some of which actually contradict each other. Some of them conflict with one another. Security at the door of a Jewish space might make some people feel safe and comfortable walking in. Other people experience security. The fact that security is needed can make other people feel vulnerable and less inclined to enter the building. And of course, for Jews of color, the potential exists for a whole other layer of vulnerability to come into play. Whether we experience ourselves as powerful or vulnerable is not neutral, it's not theoretical. We're living at a time which is confusing and I think we need to strengthen our tolerance for living at a time of both cognitive and emotional dissonance. We're going to be able, we're gonna to have to be able to sustain this dissonance, to sustain this place of confusion that we find ourselves in today. What I want to suggest this evening is that the Jewish calendar, and specifically the holidays marked on the Jewish calendar, offers a framework for thinking about this ambiguity. Essentially, what I want to argue is that it's the blank space between Purim and Pesach, and then between Pesach and Purim, which is of course a longer time span, that captures the place which many of us are currently inhabiting. It's a place where the reality of power bumps up against the reality of vulnerability. Purim and Pesach provide two radically different frameworks or paradigms for thinking about Jewish power and Jewish vulnerability. There are occasions in life and in the world which call for a clear deployment of a Purim paradigm, 
or a clear deployment for a Pesach paradigm. Most occasions, however, call for something less absolute, less clear-cut, less one-dimensional. Most occasions call or consist of ambiguity, and accordingly, they require us to think strategically, intentionally. We need to think deliberatively and with discretion about what to do and how to do it. We need to draw from both reservoirs that Purim and Pesach provide for us. So let's unpack a little bit what I mean by the Purim framework and the Passover framework. We're gonna start with Pesach. The message of Passover from the biblical telling through the Haggadah is that you have to remember your vulnerability, you have to hold on to your trauma as enslaved people. Why is that? So that you don't treat anybody else who is a stranger, who is an other, in the way that you were treated in Egypt. So that you don't traumatize or victimize anybody else. It would have made sense, it would have been really intuitive for the Bible to come along and say, you were once victims and nobody helped you, and therefore, you don't have to help anybody else. Or the Bible could have easily said, you were once victims, and make sure you are never victims again, and therefore, do everything in your power to shore up your defenses, to take care of your own, to turn inward and don't let anybody in. You could even argue that ethically, it's wrong to ask a victimized people to recall their victimization, to potentially undergo re-trauma, re-traumatization, not sure if that was a word, for the sake of other marginalized groups. And yet, this is precisely what the Bible and the Haggadah ask us to do. Let's look at this inside. Let's look at, we're gonna start with source number three from the book of Deuteronomy. The Bible says, and of course there is multiple occasion, occasions when the Bible or offers a formulation of this same trope. The Bible says, for your God is God supreme and Lord supreme, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who shows no favor and takes no bribe but rather upholds the cause of the fatherless and the widow and befriends the stranger providing food and clothing. You too must love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. By the way, in Leviticus, it says you, we're all familiar with Leviticus 19.19, which says you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. It also says in Leviticus that you must love the stranger as you love yourself. What I think is powerful about this particular formulation is that it takes God and describes God as omnipotent, as wielding re massive reservoirs of power and awesomeness. And it says that even God, with all of God's power, makes it a priority to take care of those who are marginalized and those who are weak and vulnerable. Now, let's look at the Haggadah, which is source number four. In the Haggadah, this is how we start the Seder. We read, Halach Ma'anya. This is the bread of destitution and affliction that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Anyone who is famished should come and eat. Anyone who is in need should come and partake of the, pa of the Pesach sacrifice. Now we are here, next year we will be in the land of Israel. This year we are slaves, next year we are, will be free people. A great Seder icebreaker is to go around and ask, who do you think we are meant to invite to our Seder table? Who are the hungry that the Haggadah here is describing? Is it the family who just wants to eat, who just wants to get to the meal? Is it people in the community who may not have another place to go? Is it somebody off the street? Is it somebody who is physically hungry? Is it somebody who is emotionally hungry for friendship, for community, for a, a Seder table? The Haggadah here seems to be instantiating 
what the Bible tells us to do, to love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And what better place to invite strangers in and feed them than at the Passover table where we recall the experience of being enslaved people in Egypt. It's easy to read these grand moral pronouncements in ancient literature, in the Bible, in the Haggadah. It's much harder to consider the ways in which these pronouncements might resonate in our contemporary contexts and to apply these pronouncements to the impossible dilemmas that we are encountering today. I will be totally transparent and say that I was ambivalent about putting source number five on the source sheet. It was a really hard article for me to read. And yet, I think that Jose Andres, who's the a Gentile celebrity chef of um, who does awesome humanitarian world, humanitarian work all over the world, but most recently in Israel and Gaza. I think he really captures a core message of Pesach. What does he write in this, in this, in this piece that he wrote a week ago? The peoples of the Mediterranean and Middle East, regardless of ethnicity and religion, share a culture that values food, as a powerful statement of humanity and hospitality, of our shared hope for a better tomorrow. There's a reason at this special time of year, Christians make Easter eggs, Muslims eat an egg at iftar dinners, and an egg sits on the Seder plate. This symbol of life and hope reborn in spring extends across religions and cultures. I have been a, a stranger at Seder dinners. I have heard the ancient Passover stories about being a stranger in the land of Egypt, the commandment to remember with a feast before you that the children of Israel were once slaves. It is not a sign of weakness to feed strangers. It is a sign of strength. The people of Israel need to remember at this darkest hour what strength truly looks like. Really, what the invitation to invite strangers to our Seder does is make us possibly more vulnerable. It means that we are flinging open the doors of our home and inviting anybody who is hungry in. And I think that's a metaphor for what this Passover paradigm is really all about. It is saying that even when we have power, we can make ourselves vulnerable, more vulnerable, and behave towards the other, towards the stranger, with compassion and with empathy. Now, I think it's really important, as, as powerful as source number five might be, I think it's really important to look for and to locate and to amplify the Jewish voices that are articulating the same message. And that's where Edgar Carrot comes in. So some of you might be familiar with, uh, with Carrot's work. I think this short story, Plague of the Firstborn, is included in a, in, a, um, in a book of short stories, which might be entitled, The Bus Driver Who Wanted to Be God. Does that sound, I'm not sure if that sounds, does that, is that my right about that? Okay, great. So, Edgar Carrot, we're not going to read this all inside, but this is also a great piece to bring to your Seder table. It's short enough uh, that people can read it at the Seder. Um, but I'll just summarize a couple of key parts of it and offer my interpretation of what Carrot is doing here. So here, what Carrot does is imagine the scene in an Egyptian home during the 10th plague when all of the firstborn sons are killed. And I won't spoil the ending, but the domestic tableau that he presents is one that is completely destabilized, tragic, filled with anguish. We'll just read the last few lines. 
again, I don't want to spoil the ending. Mother fell at his feet and let loose a sob of one who has suffered an invisible blow. Thus did the four of us stand, motionless, steady, and transfixed like a cedar about to be felled. Cruel indeed is the God of the Hebrews, father said. Then he turned on his heel and left the room. Now what I think Edgar Carrot is asking of his readers is to imagine what the inside of a Palestinian home looks like at this point in Gaza. That's what he's asking his readers to do with this story. He's saying, even when it comes to your enemies, imagine, picture for yourself what they are undergoing. And Karen, in that sense, is really taking the message of Passover and bringing it into his contemporary milieu. I want to turn now to the Purim paradigm, which ritualizes or canonizes a very different message. Hovering over Purim is the memory of Amalek, the tribe that attacked the Israelites, that, attract, that attacked the scragglers, the vulnerable, the weak, on their way out of Egypt. And we read this injunction to obliterate, to annihilate the memory of, Am of Amalek right before, on the Shabbat before Passover and Parshat Zachor. And of course, we read on Purim itself the passage from Exodus describing the battle with Amalek. So let's look at this passage, source number seven, from the book of Deuteronomy. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. How, undeterred by fear of God, he surprised you on the march when you were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers in your rear. Therefore, when your God grants you safety from all your enemies around you, in the land that your God is giving you as a hereditary portion, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So I think this text is meant to leave us feeling uneasy, maybe even queasy. And I'll just ask you this now. What would you say, what's the message of Deuteronomy that emerges here? No pressure. <laughs> yes, please. Can you stand up? memory and do not forget great just turned on the uh, so I'll just repeat what you said that there is this strange dissonance where you need to be on the one hand you said prepare to take revenge we'll talk about that but there's this dissonance at the end of blotting out the memory of Amalek on the one hand and not forgetting on the other so on the one hand, there is this expectation that when your God grants you safety from all your enemies around you, so when you are secure, when you are stable in your land, that is when you can either take revenge or maybe a different reading is that's when you have the power, when you have the strength and the wherewithal to actually destroy evil from your midst, that that should be part of your mission, destroying evil. People who kill women and children should not be allowed, or I'm sorry, the, it's also, it's ambiguous here, what does it mean, the memory of Amalek, right? But whether it's the people or whether it's the symbol of that evil, that should be destroyed. And then at the same time, it's the fact that we are also in the same breath commanded lo tishkach, do not forget. That suggests that you're never going to succeed. 
that there's always going to be evil or some type of threat lurking. There's always going to be an Amalek in the shadows waiting to attack you. Destroying Amalek, whether it's symbolic or whether it's actual, can never be fully actualized. And I think we see that in the next story, in source number eight, which is from the book of Samuel, where God confoundingly commands Saul, King Saul, to kill the men, women, and children, not to spare a soul, and even to kill the oxen and the sheep, the camels and the asses. This seems like complete and total annihilation. And here God does say, it seems to be some sort of punishment or revenge. And it is real, it is not symbolic here. And then what happens, Saul, if you look at the, um, the second paragraph, starting with verse number seven. Saul destroyed Amalek from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is close to Egypt, and he captured King Agag of Amalek alive. He prescribed all the people, putting them to the sword, but Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the secondborn, the lambs, and all else that was of value. They would not prescribe them. They prescribed only what was cheap and worthless. So what's the message here? What does King Saul do? He does something which is morally unfathomable, and yet he saves the king. He aggrandizes himself by saving the king of Amalek and keeping all of the material goods, all of the spoil, the loot, the booty that was actually valuable. Now, for this discrepancy, and again, you can interpret this story in so many different ways, but for this discrepancy, God takes the kingship away from Saul and gives it to King David. And this question of, well, why, why was Saul punished so harshly for not fulfilling God's commandment, it's possible that you get some of the answer to that with Purim. Why? Because who is Haman? If you look at source number, five, number nine, who is Haman? Haman ben Hamedata Ha'agagi. Haman seems to be a descendant of the King Agag, the Amalekite, who King Saul let live. So it's not just that King Saul let one king live, that he enriched himself, that he didn't follow the law of God, that he committed a moral abomination. It's also the case that he creates a condition of vulnerability for his descendants. That perhaps there is some idea that he had the opportunity to really expunge evil, wickedness, and he failed at that. And generations later, his descendants face the consequences of his actions. So in Source 9, and I only excerpted a few, um, a few parts, a few relevant parts of the Megillah, we see a response. What's the Jewish response to Amalek, to the presence of evil uh, in our midst, to this idea that there is always a threat lurking somewhere? What is the message of Purim? I think the message is to always be vigilant, not to be naive, not to let your guard down, Built into the biblical commandment to annihilate the memory of Amalek is never to forget. And what's the response? How is this ritualized on Purim itself? It is to deploy whatever it takes to survive. So think about the story of the Megillah. Think about the story of Esther. You marry one of your own, maybe you prostitute one of your own to the pagan king, you put her in a precarious position. You use political savvy, cunning, maybe something even kind of Machiavellian or um, manipulative 
to save yourself, to save your community. There's a tremendous amount of killing at the end of the Megillah. It's hard to read about. And some of the killing seems to be in self-defense, but there is some killing at the end that could be read as gratuitous. Maybe it's revenge, maybe it's deterrent. Then think about how we commemorate Purim today. Well, Pesach asks us to fling open our doors and to invite anybody in to sit at the Seder table with us. Purim seems to do something different. If you think about the mitzvot, the commandments associated with Purim, to deliver mishloach manot, each person to their friend, to celebrate and feast with our communities, to sustain the poor people living in our midst, those commandments seem to be an effort at community organizing, community building. I think these rituals are meant to reinforce ties with one another, to create a sense of connectedness, solidarity. I told my kids this year for Mishloach Manot, I was trying to kind of rein, rein it in a bit, um, not successfully. I said, you can each pick five people that you want to give Mishloach Manot to, and I said, you can't just give to your friends. I want you to think about people who are not in your age group, people who might be new to our community, people in the neighborhood who we might not know so well. Because I really think that's what Mishloach Manot is all about. It's about showing up on somebody's doorstep and creating a tie, a connection with them. I was even wondering as I was preparing for this year if all of the descriptions of the horsemen and the riders, the ha'achshtar panim, right? I always feel bad for the people who have to read that chapter of the Megillah, it's a tough word. Um, the ha'achshtar panim v'ha'pachot, that maybe the Megillah is reminding us that even when the Jewish community is far flung in the Persian Empire, even when you know, there are Jewish communities that are all over the world, we have technologies, we have horses. Today we have other technologies, even more efficient and cheaper technologies to connect with those communities, to connect with Jewish communities that are outside, that are geographically removed from the ones in which we find ourselves. Pesach asks us to retell the story and imagine that we just left Egypt. And Purim also asks us to do that. The Jews, and if you look, um, here, if you look at, in the middle of page number nine, where it says, Mordechai recorded these events and he sent dispatches to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus, near and far, charging them to observe the 14th and 15th days of Adar every year. We see something similar, that the Jews are accepting upon themselves, upon their descendants, and the Megillah says this explicitly, and upon those who join the Jewish community later on. So the Jews at this time, they'd only, they don't only accept the obligation now and for themselves, they ex accept this obligation for generations to come and even for people who join the Jewish community, who are not born into it. And they accept these obligations, the obligations incurred by the miraculous events of the Purim story. In the Megillah we read, and these days of Purim shall never cease among the Jews, and the memory of them shall never perish among their descendants. And we hold on to the memory of this experience. Why? Why do we hold on to this memory? So that we are prepared for the next time this happens. We invest in our community, we try to strengthen our solidarity. We try to consolidate our power so that we have the resources to stave off Haman the next time this comes about. You know, one of the great kind of um, features of the Megillah is that God's name is left out. And 
I once wrote this up in a Dvar Torah, and it was too heretical for the community that I was part of at the time, so it got sent back to me with all sorts of red, red marks on it. Um, so I changed communities. I, but what, what I thought of at the time was that, why is the reason that God's name left out? Because it's an invitation for people to step in. God's name is left out because God actually doesn't have anything to do with the Purim story. I use the word miraculous. It's not miraculous. It's not supernatural. It's actually human initiative, and it's human, it's human ingenuity that actually saves the Jews. And maybe the message here is that Jewish people throughout the generations you might experience something similar. Don't wait for God. God is not going to show up. You need to invest in yourselves. You need to invest in your leadership. And you need to make sure, you need to turn inward and make sure that your Jewish community is prepared for what comes next. Now, I want to make sure that we acknowledge that both of these paradigms, the Purim paradigm and the Pesach paradigm, are more complicated than, I than I'm making them out to be. That there are elements of nuance and complexity within each one. And I think we see this in source number 10. Avi Sagi is a, he's actually a scholar at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. And even if you read the title of this piece, The Punishment of Amalek in Jewish Tradition, Coping with a Moral Problem, you'll see what he's getting at. And what he suggests, what he argues, is that by and large, the Jewish interpretive tradition refuses to take the commandment to annihilate Amalek literally. That it is always, or that at least starting at a certain point, it was meant to be read symbolically, metaphorically. And he writes here, can the sword considered so worthless become the instrument for exterminating a real concrete nation? Moshe Amiel, who uh, lived in Eastern Europe but then, and went to Tel's yeshiva, but then ends up moving to Palestine and becomes the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. He dies two years before the state, but you can imagine that he, he can see what's coming, what is, what's happening, or the possibility at least of what is happening. He is aware of these problems, writes Sagi, and concludes that the view of Judaism is that the prosecution cannot turn into the defense Evil cannot be extirpated by evil means. Terror cannot be eliminated from the world through the use of counter-terror. The war against Amalek is waged with a book. Write this for a memorial in a book. That's from the book of Exodus, but I think we see that same trope in the Megillah, where Mordechai is writing these missives, and then the Megillah is written down and read year after year. And the blotting out of Amalek is not meant as their physical destruction. The obligation to blot out the memory of Amalek should not be understood literally. Because it is written, let sins be consumed out of the earth and not let the sinners. And as for Amalek too, the Torah stresses mainly the remembrance of Amalek. When Amalek turns into a memory, a culture, a lofty ideal, a sublime notion, it is this remembrance of Amalek that we are commanded to blot. Now, even as Avi Sagi and even as Moshe Amiel are pushing back against the idea that there was ever an intention to take this type of, let's call it what it is, a call for, to genocide literally, even as they say that, they also don't say <laughs> that they don't adopt the, per, the Pesach paradigm. They also don't talk about, they see the obligation to obliterate evil as a real obligation, even if it is done through the medium of education, through the medium of ideas. 
through the medium of the book. Still, the obligation to blot out evil stands, to not forget evil, to make sure that we have the communal resources to fight evil. All of that still stands. I want to look at another piece, probably written um, maybe 10 or 15 years after Amiel lived. This is a piece by Ritz V. Greenberg, a poet um, who moved to Palestine. He was an extremely right-wing poet. He was, he was part of the revisionist uh, party of Jabotinsky. Um, he even co-founded a group, they called themselves a fascist party. Just a side note, my new favorite uh, piece of trivia, I was reading this in the book put out by the National Library, and 101 treasure, Treasures from the National Library, which, by the way, makes an excellent Seder gift. But Ritz V. Greenberg was a good friend of Ben-Gurion's, and the National Library has a check for, I think, 5,000 liras that Ben-Gurion wrote to Ritz V. Greenberg because he saw him and noticed that he looked gaunt, that he seemed to be a starving poet. And, and Ben-Gurion wrote him this check. But, uh, Greenberg was too proud to ever cash it. But what this book describes is this incredible friendship that actually transcended politics, that they made sure to never insult each other in the Knesset. They actually maintained this friendship even though Ben-Gurion was on the left and Uritz V. Greenberg was on the right. So Greenberg, um, Greenberg comes to Palestine, I think in the 20s or so, and his family, however, is, sorry, Greenberg comes to Palestine in 1939, on the eve of World War II. His family, however, does not get out, and his, uh, his parents and siblings are killed at Auschwitz. And in this poem, and I only took a couple of excerpts from it, um, and some of you might have learned this poem. I was first introduced to it with uh, Yassi Klein Halevi. And the translation is by Rachel Karazim and Levi Morrow, who um, are both beloved members of the Hartman family in Israel. It's a very long poem, but in it, Greenberg imagines that his mother comes to him in a dream. And his mother, says to him, let me feel your body, my son. Your clothes are coarse woven fabric, my son. Soldiers wear a rifle on your shoulder. Hurrah to you, my son. Until we arrive to Jerusalem, my son. And yes, mother. And when we get to Jerusalem, my son, the royal sanctuary, city of kings, oh, not even on Shabbat will you change these clothes, my son. Once, I wanted to see you always dressed in silk. I do not want that anymore. As you say, mother, and always with a rifle, my son. Amen, mother. And then this part is the most provocative piece. And when the Redeemer comes and nations beat their swords into plowshares and throw their guns into the fire, not you, no, my son, not you. No, mother, lest the Goyim rise again and amass iron, lest they rise again and we shall not be ready, as we were not ready until now. Oh, your words are holy, mother. All the Jews who have fallen to Gentile swords are brought on the wind, Jerusalem ward, to the western wall, and from there to the cave of David our king, and from there they are gathered in until the coming of Shiloh. I answer the heavenly voice and cry out, holy, 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 mine forever, forever, like my mother, this western wall and this cave of David, our king on Mount Zion, Jerusalem forever and ever, amen. This is, it's like an anti-messianic poem. It's an, it takes the book of Isaiah, all of the beautiful words that I think are written on the UN, in the building of the UN, Right, nations should beat their um, swords into plowshares and throw their guns into the fire. And she says, don't do that. I want you to take your plowshares and I want you to beat those plowshares into swords. 
She almost seems to be saying, or maybe Greenberg is saying, God, when God gave that prophecy to Isaiah, God did not count on the Holocaust. And that changes everything. She and the mother and Greenberg don't mention Purim or Amalek explicitly here. But I think that is really what is at stake. And that's the message that Greenberg is offering in this poem. He's saying, never let down your guard, even on Shabbat. On Shabbat, we're not supposed to carry weapons around. On the Temple Mount, these two places in time and in space of peace, right? Why, was King, why couldn't King David build the temple? Because he was a man of war. That's why it's left to his son Solomon. And yet, even on Shabbat, even on the Temple Mount, what does Greenberg's mother say? Wear your uniform and carry your weapons and never let yourself, again, be unprepared. Never let yourself be slaughtered the way that we were in the Holocaust. So, what do we do with all of this? We have Purim on the one hand, we have Pesach on the other hand. Even within the ambiguity and the tension that exist within these holidays, for the most part, I would say that the messaging is consistent and clear. And there might be times, there might be times when we find ourselves with clarity, with moral clarity, and with the ability to turn to one of these paradigms and use it. There are times which call for Purim, and there are times for, which call for Pesach. And yet, remember that Purim and Pesach on the calendar itself, if we're thinking kind of metaphorically, they only take up a fraction of the year, right? A handful of days, less than 10 days altogether. And I think what that signifies is that for most of the year, we're living betwixt and between these two paradigms. I think that what's common to both of these holidays is that they're asking us to be made relevant. They're asking us to remember our history, to hold on to our trauma, to hold on to our past, to remember our myths, to remember our heroes, in order to cultivate our present identities, in order to guide us when it comes to how we should be responding to our contemporary moments. They're asking us to draw on that, that these are holidays and the texts and the traditions and the rituals, they are resources that we can use in navigating our present. But I think that there is something else going on here. I think what these two markers on the calendar, on the Jewish calendar, are asking us to do is to get comfortable living in the space between Purim and Pesach. There is something that's morally, spiritually, existentially exhausting <laughs> about this. We don't have a clear model or an absolute paradigm to turn to. I think that's the reality that we have to accept today. This lack of clarity, however, can also be construed as a blank canvas. And maybe it's an opportunity to write a new chapter in the Torah of Jewish power, in the Torah of Jewish vulnerability, in the Torah of Jewish peoplehood. And my blessing for all of us is that your satyrs, when you have family and friends and an intergenerational crowd, and maybe there's a diversity of opinions and positions about what Israel should be doing or not doing, how we as American Jews should be reacting, what should be happening on our college campuses, how much security we need. 
maybe this Seder is an opportunity to jumpstart the process of writing this Torah. And those debates that can sometimes get a little bit rancorous can also be generative, and they can be a place where we can draw on the wisdom of our elders and on the experiences that they bring and also pull our children and the younger generation and the passion and the zeal and what they're seeing in the world, that we can bring these all together and actually write the Torah that we need for this moment, the Torah that I think is necessary for the space, the days, between Purim and Pesach, between Pesach and Purim. So I hope that that's what your seders accomplish, or at least begin to accomplish. It's meant to be celebratory. It's meant to be an opportunity to ask questions, to come up with ideas. I think it's okay if it's not saturated with meaning every single minute. If we can also just have fun, it can be an opportunity to also breathe a little bit. That's okay. We still fulfill the obligations of the Seder. But I do think that we can start the process of developing the Torah that we need for this moment. Thanks, everybody, and Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Sarah, thank you so much. You have given us so much content, so much substance, so much to think about. I know that Amy shared that you want to take questions. Sure. So let me just um, invite anyone who has any questions. Uh, Michael Gardner. He's got the first question. Michael. Thank you. Th thanks so much. We saw you at Hartman uh, this past uh, June. And, um, it's nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. And, and it's just a real pleasure to, to have you and, and, and listen to you. Um, I, I think in many ways the, the, these issues are, are, are really questions um, about power. And what does it mean? What, what is true power? really mean. My own view was that Saul was punished because he didn't take the, the he didn't do or not do what he was supposed to do out of out of mercy. I don't think that's what he what, what was driving him. Yes. I think he was doing it because he had a certain attraction to Amalek and what Amalek was mm. doing and he saw a certain appeal to what it would mean to be a leader to have some of those qualities. Hmm. And, and that's why he kept him alive. And I think true strength is, is you don't have to act out of vengeance. You can act out of mercy. And when you don't do either, then that's when you get in trouble. Hmm. Um, and... Uh, and it's very hard to, to, to see the balance between the two. Uh, it's almost like when the Americans welcomed the uh, Nazi scientists into America. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing it out of compassion. They were doing it, and they weren't doing it out of mercy. They were doing it out of a sense of, of, of vulnerability um, because of what they saw was coming down with Russia. And, 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 it's, that, and it's that action, I think, which, which started the us down the path of, of being in real trouble. You know, we don't have time to look at it inside, but I would recommend um, on that point, source number 10, which is a piece that Yeshayahu Leibovitch, who is the iconoclastic Israeli thinker and brother to Nechama Leibovitch, the Bible commentator, um, but he has this piece called After Kibia. Kibia was an episode, uh, not an episode, it was, um, it was an event in the early 50s where the, um, there was a, an attack on a Jewish settlement and the IDF went into Kibia and, um, and killed a number of people, I think threw grenades, threw grenades into a number of homes. And Leibovitch is really reflecting here on, you know, what is, what's the right use of power? And he speaks about very powerfully, I mean, one thing that he says is that, you know, Jews have never been tested before. 
right? It was very easy for Jews to present themselves as humanitarian and as, you know, with a moral compass when they didn't have the tools to do, to actually engage in any kind of um, mass murder. He says that explicitly. Um, he says we were, we had, there are certain spiritual benefits that come from conditions of exile, foreign rule, and political impotence. impotence, impotence sorry. He says that, that we've never been tested by what he calls this crucible of reality. And now we can commit. We have, there is an impulse to communal murder, and we have the tools at our disposal. And what Leibovitch goes on to argue is that he says, you know, we can justify what the IDF did. There was tremendous world condemnation at the time. And he said, can we justify it legally? Yes, we can justify it. But the, what he goes on to say, he compares it to, um, he compares it to what Yaakov's sons, Shimon and Levi, do to Shechem. He says there's something cursed about it. And we should be asking ourselves, he says this at the very end, it's quite powerful. He, sa he says, we must ask ourselves what produced this generation of youth which felt no inhibition or inner compunction in performing the atrocity when given the inner urge an external occasion for retaliation? That's the question that he asks. He acknowledges that, he says, it's impossible to know for sure. Is this justified? Is it not justified? He says it's um, on page 13, I, I bolded it. He says, the distinction between the permissible and the forbidden, you know what, I'll, I'll go back. He says, because it's just so relevant, I think, and, I, and it speaks to your point, the problematic issues concern the manner of conducting that war, which goes on to this very day, and what is to be done after this war will be over. It is a difficult and perplexing problem. Once the craft of Esau, right, fight warfare, has been granted legitimacy, the distinction between the permissible and the forbidden, between the justified and the blameworthy is very subtle. It is like that hand breadth between heaven and hell. We must constantly examine whether we have transgressed and crossed that fine dividing line. So I think you're absolutely right, Michael, that this is a question about how we use power and what is new for the Jewish people, or it's 75 years old, is that we haven't really had to ask that question before, and now we do. Hi, Ellie Sachs. Uh, through your uh, conversations with your Israeli Hartman colleagues, uh, can, do you have any insight as to what will be happening at the Seder table in Israel? So I hope it's okay for me to put a plug in. <laughs> is that for the, there is um, a supplement, an October 7th supplement that the Hartman Institute, um, that Misha El Tzion and Noam Tzion put out and in Hebrew. And my wonderful colleague, Jessica, Rabbi Jessica Fisher, uh, really spearheaded the initiative to translate it, both into English, but also to translate it more culturally um, for North American uh, Jewish audiences. I don't, I think that, you know, if I, if I, um, if I could generalize, I think that there is not going to be any uniform, anything that, you know, kind of, that's kind of Hartman, that everybody, there's such diversity and richness of difference. Um, I will say that, you know, to this point, we, did, we translated this Seder supplement and added to it. What we did not undertake, and there was a, a thought about doing this, was a, rich, um, a ritual for Yom HaShoah, which has already been um, written, it's called Hitkansut, 
But in Israel, they added to that ritual, and they called it Hitkansut, gathering together, and Hitgabrut. I don't even know. We, we couldn't even think about how to translate that, you know, kind of empowerment or overpowering or overcoming. And that was that. It's called this. It's also it's a seder. It's meant to sort of reflect the Passover seder, and it's specifically for Yom Hashoah. But we didn't. It didn't. Didn't feel organic to actually translate that specific ritual into English. But maybe next year. Ellie, thank you. We'll take two last questions and then close up. Uh, David and then Joe. Hi. There's one part of the seder that always um, <clears throat> creates confusion for me. That's when we open the door for Eliyahu and we say, Shpoch hamadcha l'agoyim. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, first of all, it's so strange that that is what we choose to say when we're inviting Eliyahu, yeah. the harbinger of, of uh, the Mashiach. But also, it seems like a, um, it seems like we're falling back on our position yeah. when we were slaves, where mm -hmm. we relied on God to fight mm -hmm. our battles for us. Um, what, uh, I'm searching for something to put in its place uh, that would yeah. reflect our current reality where we do fight our own battles. Mm. I know that there is a piece in the supplement and it goes back to one of the, uh, one of Mishael and Noam's Haggadah, of pouring out, God pouring out God's love. I know that's not exactly addressing um, your question. You know, what's kind of magical about the Haggadah is that it is, it's been kind of reified into a book or canonized, but I mean, I'm not a rabbi, so forgive, I, I'm, I hope it's okay for me to say this, but I think it's meant to be malleable I think it's meant to actually be um, brought up to date. I don't think it's meant to be petrified. Um, I think that it would be a really amazing exercise for you to think about what, when we open the door to Eliyahu, what should we, what should we actually be thinking about? What does Eliyahu represent? Eliyahu is also somebody, by the way, who disguises himself as a beggar, right? And what should, that, what should that moment at the Seder actually look like? Whether it's oriented towards Eliyahu or whether it's oriented towards people um, and towards human empowerment. Um, the other thing that I would suggest you look at is, and this is also in the Hartman Supplement, but you can find other, ex other so many examples online, the Haggadot that were crafted in the early years of the state. There are Haggadot from the Gaza envelope that are included in the supplement. There are selections from them, but it would be really interesting to see how they, um, how they dealt with this, with this question. David, thank you for your question. LA, thank you for your question. Our last question is from Joe Wolke. Sarah, thank you, first of all, for kind of bringing to the fore the, the struggle with the story of Amalek. But I have a question and understand that I'm a half class full kind of guy. I have often seen or, or, or felt as I read the story of blotting out the memory of Amalek that it's more, there are times we should live as if we are not threatened, as if we are, mm. forget the fact that we're threatened, we are free. And, and I see that as the kind of the bookend which, which Pesach provides. And I'm just curious if, if there are writings on this or, or there are commentaries that reflect it that way. Thank you, Joe. That's, I don't know, that's a good question. That's a good place to end. I'm not sure. I think that, um, you know, it's hard for me to read Amalek I love that you're trying to read Amalek from a optimistic, aspirational point of view. Um, also, a good exercise to undertake. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Sarah, let me, um, let me just end with um, a reference to Daniel and Yossi's podcast from last week. 
which was the six month anniversary. Yeah. It was kind of the Cheshbon HaNefesh, which yeah. is how Daniel reflected it, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking account of and reflecting on it. And it, the whole thing, I just really commend it. It's so powerful and poignant. But there's one particular moment that connects directly to this whole conversation. Daniel is mentioning the fact that there was some magical night at Hartman recently. And three elite commanders of Duv Devan, the elite commanders of the elite, you know, brigade, the elite fighting brigade came. And they came and they were at Hartman and they were reflecting. And so they're all on the same team and they're all at the same rank and they're all the, the best fighters of the best fighting unit. And then there's a machloket, a, a reasonable disagreement between them that Daniel mentions in the, in the podcast. One says, what we've learned from six months is that only if we put our, our boot on the throat yeah. of Gaza's, put our boot on the throat and then have our knife out, that is the only way we will ever live. Which, P.S., is pure Moshe Dayan, the Roy Eisenberg thing in 1956, that of course they wanted to kill us, We'd, we want to kill them too if we were in their shoes, and the only way we ever survive is if we go like that. And that was one Duv Devon guy. And the other Duv Devon guy, so that's, I guess, Purim Torah. Yeah. And the other Duv Devon was, was a younger generation, said, that's just no way to live. Why would we ever want to live in a country right. where that had to be the reality? Mm -hmm. And I remember when I, when I was in Israel uh, two months ago, a dispute between two nephews. My nephew, David, who's a rabbi, he's the rabbi of Moriah Congregation who said there's no military solution to this, and the army cannot purchase a solution. Mm. There's no military solution. And my nephew, Yeshayahu, who's been in Gaza, who's now back in Mil Miluim, um, uh, who said that that's the reality, and they want to kill us, and we have to be ready. So I guess what I'm saying is, even in the Duv Devan unit, uh, and, and among brothers in the same family yeah. who love each other, there's this tension between Purim and Pesach, Purim and Pesach um, is unresolved. But I, I think that's so powerful because I think in some ways we need both. In other words, to truly craft, to truly craft Torah for this moment and to really live in this moment, we actually need, we can't be living in an echo chamber, we actually need a multiplicity of yeah. voices that are challenging each other. So well, thank you for that. Well, Sarah, thank you for giving us the categories. Uh, and thank you, uh, Hartman, for bringing Sarah to us. I want to thank Jessica, Jesse, and Jonathan, our wonderful Hartman colleagues, uh, and Sarah for coming here. Uh, I don't even know how I could think about Israel or about Judaism without Hartman and the content and the categories mm -hmm. that you provide us. So thank you. By the way, the next and final conversation of the year with the Hartman Scholar will be May 1, Alana Steinhain is gonna be here on May 1. And that's only the last one of the year if you don't go to CLP in Jerusalem. But if you go to CLP in Jerusalem, you'll have this kind of content plus Jerusalem beginning on June 26th. Exactly. I can't recommend that highly enough. Mm -hmm. Chag Kasher Chag